I'm the back. She's uh, just been coming with me, and um, I'm like her mentor for her school. And uh, so she's been a real big help to us here at the church, and she's been doing sound, and she's been just doing some things to help us out, being a roadie. And so thank you, Ariana, for all your help and stuff. And um, we're going to be performing at her school, um, actually at the Lancet, like in a couple of weeks. So um, just be praying for her because she needs your prayers because she's trying to finish school on a high, high note. And then she also has, you know, this thing coming up. So just remember our young kids, you know, they're going through so much going to school. And um, I'm looking around here and we're all around the same age here. And our school wasn't, we didn't deal with a lot of the stuff we're having to deal with today. We're not. I mean, they're dealing with tons of stuff. It's the biggest thing being social media. So just always remember our kids and pour into those around you that are young because they need they need um, people to come alongside of them and help them help them through. So thank you. Let's all rise <clears throat> as we uh, go before the Lord and pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for this place, this place of worship, this place where we can come and we can just say prayers to you, we sing to you, we can, um, we can just share everything with you. We thank you for our times of, of uh, quiet times and the time in our word this week, and we pray that now as we come and hear your word together, yeah, and we worship you together. Um, it's just so beautiful that we're doing it together. And yet I know you have a separate nugget for each person here. And we can walk out the door and say, I know that was for me. And I thank you, Jesus, so much for that. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for our salvation, God. And thank you for this, this beautiful sun that's coming through this window here, Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you provide for us. And we love you so much. And we offer these songs as just prayers from our heart, starting with the Our Father. And we just thank you that um, that we get to be here tonight. Thank you for George and, and for Sal, Lord, for their faithfulness to be here every week, every week, God. And thank you so much because it builds us all up. It builds us. And yes, Lord, you would be with Des and with Rob as they're feeling um under the weather today and not doing well, just having colds. So would you please be with them and be with our pastor and with Robin, God, and in the loss of this little, this little, their daughter having a miscarriage and just be with them, Father. And those who are here tonight that need your hand, they need to hold on to you, Father. Would you please comfort them in a mighty way tonight? We all sometimes come in here on mountaintops and sometimes we're in valleys, so Lord, just come. Just come. We invite you here because this is why we're here, to, to meet with you, to worship you. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the, your unfailing love for us. We're so grateful to be children of the risen King. You are truly the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And yes, no one goes to the Father except through you. Thank you so much for always being here for us. No matter how unfaithful we can be, you're always faithful to us, Jesus. We love you with all our heart. Your holy and precious name we pray.
Thank you guys for coming. You guys are doing awesome. Thank you for everything. Thank you for coming along on this beautiful Wednesday night. I was going to say Wednesday morning, but again, it, it's not. I was something. It's something. Golly. So today we're going to be, uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out. We're going to be in 1 Peter. 1 Peter. That's good. It's a good book right here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. And this is a, this is a pretty good book. Um, this is a tough one to break down, but it's good. Uh, so if I oversimplify it, then let me know. So what I was thinking of this week is, is I was thinking, and I was wondering for everybody else, I was like, do you, ever guys, do you guys ever wonder if you just have a day where you just completely crash, you wake up, you look like one of those, they have pun, a bunch of memes on it. It's, uh, it's like a dog and he comes out and poor little guy looks like he's legit been hibernating for about eight years. It's like you wake up, you take a nap, and then this is what you look like when you wake up 10 hours later. I die laughing because that was me. Every month or so, I'll have a night when I'm so tired that I'm gonna lay down on the couch, in bed, whatever. I just, I'm out, I'm exhausted. It happened this last week, a few hours of being asleep. I woke up and all I wanted to do was just brush my teeth, go right back to bed. That was it. I, I didn't wanna do anything else. I didn't wanna eat. I just wanted to go back to sleep, but I couldn't. I had already told my brother that I'd go help him um, fix something with his TV. And I mean, before you guys think like I'm a good brother or anything, we didn't fix the TV. I think I made it worse. Um, but but I, 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 my point is this: I had something to do. It wasn't about me. Okay. Later on, my brother said I, you know, I didn't have to go. Obviously, that was after I didn't really help him with the TV. I, he's like, you could have done, could have done it a different day. I get it. But and if I'm honest, I almost didn't. I didn't want to go. I, I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to leave my house. I was tired. I was exhausted. I don't want to do anything. But I had to, I, I wanted to. It wasn't about me, so I got up and, and I went, even though I was tired. And if there was a consistent theme, little thread running throughout my life lately, it's just that. I'm tired, I'm just tired. I, I, don't, I don't really wanna do the next hard thing. I'm not complaining, it's just a very real thing that as human beings you get, you get tired. But again, it's not about me. God has blessed me with plenty of things in my life that are not about me, thank God. So I keep going. And if I ask for a show of hands, I'm not. But if I ask for a show of hands, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who feel tired tonight. As I was um, working through this sermon, I really wrestled with this Bible passage. I mean, this, this stuff's hitting some very specific areas in life that I really just didn't feel like talking about. But the good thing about talking with God is the more you read his word, the more he'll change your thinking to match his. So it all worked out. He won, obviously. I'm going to bounce around, but we're going to start off looking at the second part of verse 20 and into verse 21. And it says this, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow his steps. God's called me to do good, right? And if God's called me to do good, then he's going to give me what I need to continue doing good. Because here's the deal. Sometimes doing good isn't easy. Actually, most of the time in this world, and it's getting harder, doing good is hard. 
And because it's not easy, God wants us to endure it patiently. That, that's what I want us to see this evening. For the Lord's sake, you can keep going. You can keep doing good. And that's the necessity right there. We have to have it in our minds that we're not doing this for us. That's a key theme in our human lives. Being human, it's very, very easy to not do things when it comes to doing it for ourselves. Oh, I got to get up. I got to make my bed. Now I'm good. I got to get up. I got to cook food. You know what? I'll just order in. But if it's for somebody else, do you notice how it's a lot easier to do for those you love? Your mom calls. Your grandma calls. Your brother calls. You can do anything. Even if you end up ruining their TV, it's fine. You got up. You tried. You could do it for them. So for the Lord's sake, who we love so much, our dear Lord, you can keep going. I can keep going. We can keep doing good. And tonight I want us to look at three areas of life that Peter is addressing. And it's in these areas, these arenas, that we can live out our hope to do good for, the, for God's sake, for the Lord's sake. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first area that Peter's talking about, he's talking about our role as citizens of this world. Not citizens of God's kingdom. We're there, obviously. We are citizens of God's kingdom, but we're also citizens of this world. And he's talking about that. As a citizen under the rule of government. And this is a hot button topic right here. I can go into as many different houses and you'll have as many different news channels on as there are people. You have CNN on one, you'll have Fox on the other, you'll have, shoot, I don't even know what, I don't even have the news on because it stresses me out so much. But this government deal, it's a big thing. Here's, here's what we see first. And even when we're tired, you can do good as a worldly citizen. Now let me define two phrases before we go any further. First thing, do good. That, that's the first phrase I want us to really get in our brains. When we see this phrase used in this passage, doing good is living in a way that is, as an earthly citizen, it draws positive attention towards God. That's what doing good is. It's not being kind. It, it's not going and saying whatever, uh, whatever everybody else says is good. It's not, uh, it's not being a nice person. It's not smiling. No, it's anything that you do that draws attention to God. So yes, of course, it can be being kind. It can be having a smile on your face, but the first and foremost, it has to draw attention to God, doing good. I love the quote by Karen H. Jobes. She says, it is God's will, not simply Peter's, that Christians do good even in pagan societies. For by such behavior, they will silence the slander about Christianity. And all the more so if they are publicly recognized by the authorities for good works that benefit their city. Verse 21 tells us we are called to a lifestyle that benefits those around us while silencing slander against us. That's saying, you know what, do good so much that everybody starts to wonder what the heck a Christian is. Okay, the next thing, next, next uh, phrase I want to look at is submit to. That's not one we're comfortable with. Submit to. This is a military term that means to arrange information under the commander. The idea is that we willingly come under leadership. Peter uses this word for each area of life that he's talking about. And it's an application specific to each area of life. So with those in mind, submit to, do good. We're going to move on. We're going to start with verse 13 through 15. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. Your ears are ringing already. I get it. Whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed... For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that you honor, that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. Now these verses, they're, they're telling us to come under the leadership of our government. As Christians, we're called to follow the rules just like everybody else. We're called to follow rules that are set before us in our society. As long as they're not going against God's law. Okay. And, and some of you are, again, some of you are thinking, you know what, I, I can't be under the leadership of the president. I, I can't be under the leadership of my boss. I can't be under the leadership of, of our Supreme Court. They're horrible. Look what's going on with abortions and human trafficking and everything else. I can't, I can't be under that leadership. They're not godly. You're like, man, have you seen the news? Obviously not. I don't watch news. Yes, I have seen the news. Look, I know we live in a crazy world with horrible rulers and crazy politicians. But so did Peter. We, again, very common theme. We need to look at this from a first century lens, not a 21st century lens. So let's look at Peter's rule. Let's look at, look at the rulers in his day. His ruler was Nero. Okay, Nero's mom, just, just quick context on, on Nero, just little anecdotes. His mom married the Roman emperor Claudius in AD 37. 
Now, in AD 54, when Nero was 17 years old, his mother arranged for Claudius to be poisoned to death, and, and Nero was proclaimed emperor of Rome. He was smart. He was a good, smart kid, but he was also very selfish, and he was young, so he wasn't, he wasn't fit to rule. He wasn't fit to be a king. And because of that, he became real, real paranoid about all these rumors and plots to kill him. Eventually, he snapped, earning his nickname of history's greatest criminal. In 55 AD, he, uh, he had his stepbrother Britannicus killed. In 59 AD, he had his mother executed. In 62 AD, his first wife was executed. And that wasn't enough. Seneca, his former counselor, was forced to commit suicide. It's widely thought and believed that Nero set Rome on fire. Complete Rome, not just a little portion burning around 70% of the city so he could rebuild it and give it all, you know, get all the glory for it. Now, the horrible part comes after this. You're like, that didn't already happen? No, the horrible part comes next. Nero blamed the fire on Christians. And, and this effect was evil. It was horrible. There had been no Christian persecution like this since Jesus had risen 30 years earlier. In Nero's gardens, Christians were crucified. They were sewn into wild beast skins, and they were fed to dogs, they were drenched in flammable oil, and they were lifted on poles to, to be torches at night. That was Peter's government. And as crazy as it was, Peter is saying right here, he's saying, submit to authority. So he's calling Christians to submit to Nero's authority. Now, as tired as some of us are with our political system and our political leaders, obviously we still have the opportunity to do good, to do the right thing, as worldly citizens. And, and if you look at verse 13, you'll know why. It says, for the Lord's sake. Not for your opinion. Not for your goals. For the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake, we are called to do good. Again, we are called to do the right thing as citizens. Because we desire to honor God. And I know the question's coming. How does this honor God? It's a tough question. But I'll tell you. It honors God because God designed human institutions, civil, political, personal. God designed every one of them, and, and he did it to keep people in check, even if that meant using ungodly men and ungodly women to do it. What does the Bible say? God can even use evil for, for his good, right? That's what verse 14 says, to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. This is God's design for government and for rulers. God wants us to live out the gospel while at the same time understanding what it means to live under the authority of somebody else. And under God's plan, even if we don't see it, even if we don't feel it, even when we feel the exact opposite, he's using that design to share his word, his mind word, with people who would have otherwise never had the chance to hear it. Now let me be clear. When we submit to government, I do have to put this in. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that we stop thinking, that we stop proclaiming the truth. It doesn't mean that we stop preaching God's word first. It doesn't mean that we don't adhere to God's word and then we just follow the government. Not at all, no. Look at verses 16 and 17. It says, for you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. Notice the first allegiance in that phrase is to God. First allegiance, always to God. You're like, obviously, we're in a church, right? But, but in all reality, our first allegiance is always, always to God. And I've heard it said before in so many ways, but I'll just say this again. We're not owned by a red donkey or a blue elephant. No, we belong to the pure white lamb. Okay? I like how Thomas Schreiner puts it. We have an implication here that ruling powers should be resisted if commands were issued that violated the Lord's will. It is impossible to imagine that one would obey worldly commands that break God's commands for the Lord's sake. It's counterintuitive. Counter counter it, it doesn't make sense. The whole point of why we show respect as a worldly citizen is because we want to put our heavenly citizenship on display. We want to be able to live in this world but show that we're not of it. For the Lord's sake, because we love God, we will do good as earthly citizens, despite what the world thinks, despite what it thinks, because this pleases God. And, and if doing good as a citizen seems way too big right now, I know a lot of times it does for me. I, shoot, man, I have a hard time taking out the trash, much less doing civil duty, voting, everything else. It's like, oh my gosh. 
If that seems too much, Peter shrinks it down. Check this out. Even when you're tired, you can do good in your workplace. Even when you're tired, you can do good while being unjustly treated. Let's look at verses, again, 18 and 20. It says, you, you who are slaves must submit to your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you. Not only what they are, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. For God is pleased when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. This text talks about the topic of slavery. And, and let me be clear, obviously slavery is evil. Scripture clearly condemns slavery. The gospel itself goes against it. And you might be thinking, well, why did Peter say that in this passage? Peter is focusing on two aspects of society as it existed, the slave-master relationship. Now, just because he's talking about a relationship between a slave and their master, it doesn't mean he's condoning it. It doesn't mean he's saying, well, that's a good thing. It just means that he understands his limits. Peter knew that he didn't have the power to abolish slavery. But what he could do was he could speak to the hearts of the ones who were enslaved. Look at prison ministry. We don't have any power to remove people from jail. But day after day, week after week, year after year, because, because we don't have the people and the power to remove uh, the prisoner, our Christian brothers and sisters, instead, they enter the prison themselves in hope of sharing the good news of God's kingdom. So, so, we, so what we see in the New Testament is we see that the writers, they, they didn't focus on the social reform of slavery, no, but instead they focused on the hearts of the slaves who were treated unjustly. And there are many places where we're going to be treated unjustly, unfairly, wrong. It might be at the, the workplace. It, it might be in the legal system. It might be in an institution. It might be in Starbucks. It might be a friend, a spouse. It could be even here at the church. There's plenty of people who have come up and complained. Who have come up, golly. Sorry, I'm tired. I told you at the beginning. There's plenty of people who have came and complained because they've been mistreated in this building. Not by God, but by humans. We're all broken. We're all, we're all works in progress. So what do we do? Well, what does it say in verses 19 and 20? It says you patiently endure. If you suffer for doing good and if you endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Does this mean, does this mean Christians are supposed to be doormats? No. Does it mean that we're supposed to be walked all over? Does it mean we're supposed to be slaves to everybody else? No. We stand up for injustice. We fight for what's right. We pray for deliverance. But in every circumstance... Every circumstance of unfair treatment, of humiliation, of being thrown under the bus, of being criticized, in every circumstance, we act in a way that brings glory to God. Okay, because if we respond in a Christ-centered way to everything that happens to us in this world, not just the good, but especially the bad, if you respond like Jesus, that brings glory to God. Have you ever heard of um, Eric Liddell? He's the uh, Scottish Olympic runner in the 1920s. Um, his story is what inspired Chariots of Fire, that, that good old movie, you know what I mean? Liddell, he's known for what the movie shows, and it's a really good movie. His religious convictions, uh, he refused to race on Sunday, all that good jazz, and it's awesome. But what we skip is what happened after he became an Olympic gold medalist. Liddell, he left to be a missionary in China in 1925. He worked in one of the poorest provinces in the country, and when war bro broke out in 1941, the British government, they ordered all their citizens to come back to leave China. But Liddell, he stayed because he knew his ultimate allegiance, it wasn't to British government, it wasn't to the Chinese people, it was to God. And when the Japanese army got closer to the city that he was in in 1942, he stayed to help these poor Chinese people that he'd given his life to. In 1943, the Japanese, they took over the city, they sent him to an internment camp where he spent the last two years of his life. And, and everybody knew who, excuse me, everybody who knew him, everybody who knew him described him as selfless, as loving, and as a completely focused human being on other people. The Japanese, they selected a, a random group to be set free, and he was one of them. But he gave his place up to a pregnant woman, and they shot him for it. That's how his life ended. So how does somebody live this way, though? I mean, you look at that whole rundown, you see all these epic things. First, you see the shock and the awe. It's a big old Olympic game. He does great. He stands up for his convictions, and you're like, right on, the Christian won. And then you see the rest of his story, and it's like, okay, that seems like he lived in hell. 
Okay, Eric Liddell didn't expect England or China to be his home. He suffered thinking only of his heavenly home. He gave himself over to the one who judges justly. He fully surrendered to God. Eric Liddell is just one of many, many people who have proven that you can do very good things for God's glory even when you're in the worst of places. And I hope these last few verses are a little bit of an encouragement to you. You can keep going because Christ never gave up. Peter reminds us that suffering is part of life. Look at verse 21. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. That's a tough pill to swallow, though, right? Like, that's tough. God says, suffer for my sake. I'm like, I don't want it. He says, it's all right, I'll help. Suffering, the one thing I want you to know, suffering isn't life itself. That's the most important thing to know about this section. It's not who we are. Again, it's part of our lives, but someday it's going to end. Notice that quickly, as, as quickly Peter, excuse me, notice that as quickly Peter says the word suffering. As soon as he says suffering is going to happen, he immediately pulls your attention over to Jesus. Jesus suffered for us, right? He could have ridden around in the, in the nicest chariots with, with the fanciest clothes, the most food anybody could ever ask for, the nicest house. He could have ruled this world. But no, he chose a donkey and willingly went to the cross instead. Look what he did. He, it says, chapter 22, he never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. In the middle of the most unfair treatment, Jesus never wavered. Jesus never gave up. And not only did he go through the mental and, and social anguish that we do, Jesus went through the physical and spiritual anguish that we do, and even more so. He went through it way worse than any of us. Verse 24 says he personally, personally carried all of our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. It ends by saying, by his wounds, you are healed. Jesus knew he would never receive earthly justice. But even so, even so, he never gave up. And look what that means for us. It tells us right there in verse 25. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. He is seated on a throne at the right hand of God the Father, holding our souls in his hand right now. That's what we got out of this deal. He never gave up because he knew that his suffering would lead to our salvation. And because of Jesus, the only way that you and I can keep going is through the power of Jesus. So how does Jesus wield his power? How does he use his power in us? By way of the Holy Spirit. So many things that are overlooked. Oh, the Holy Spirit's probably one of the biggest. We don't talk to him. But we need to because, because this means that even if you're tired, even if you're fatigued, you can keep going. You may not feel like you can take another step, but you can. You know how I know? Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus wouldn't have given that command to his three best friends taking watch in the Garden of Eden, that, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, sorry, the Garden of Gethsemane, if he didn't know that it could be done. They fell prey to their flesh, right? We know that they fell asleep. But he did say, watch and pray for the spirit is willing. You can keep going because the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you is willing to give you strength. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Jesus didn't just leave us a run-of-the-mill spirit. He didn't just give us any old spirit off the shelf. No, he left us his own almighty spirit. He left us the most powerful spirit in all of creation. Now, it stands to reason that Jesus' spirit would reflect Jesus' character, correct? And who Jesus is, over all else, is the one true God who never gives up on his people. If you truly believe that, then trust that his spirit won't give up on you either. You guys, the Bible calls him our helper for a reason. As long as you're willing to surrender, the Holy Spirit is more than willing to give you the power to keep moving forward for the Lord's sake. He's more than willing to help. There's a quote, and I love it. It says, no matter how many times you get knocked down, keep getting back up. God sees your resolve. He sees your determination. And when you do everything you can do, that's when God steps in and says, I'll do what you can't. 
for the Lord's sake, you can keep going. Some of you need to believe that. I need to believe that. We're tired. Sometimes we don't think we can keep going. Don't believe that lie. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Oh, you don't think that's enough? Look, look at this verse. I came across this and I thought it was so beautiful. Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. That's talking about Jesus, and this is a small glimpse of his power. That power raised Jesus from the dead. And that same power is what keeps you and I moving forward and doing good if we want it. Believe that truth. For the Lord's sake, you can keep doing good. <coughs> Do the things that draw attention to God and glorify him. Let's be a church that admits, yes, I'm tired, but at the same time says, for the Lord's sake, I can keep going. I can keep doing good. God will do more than we ask for or think. God will do more than you can ever ask for or ever think. And in return for that, we'll give him all the glory for it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just thank you. We thank you for the strength to have another day full of blessings from you. We thank you for your mercies that brand new every day. We ask that the times that we feel weak, we ask that you carry us. We ask that the times that you feel strong, we ask that you allow us to carry others. We ask that you allow us to be your hands and feet in this earth. We ask that you use us as instruments for your glory, your good, and for your ultimate purpose on this earth, sharing your word and bringing souls with us to heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
really cool quote by Muhammad Ali this week. And I don't know if I should put it in there, but I figured I'd tell you guys now. I'm just, just kind of uh, condensing it. He says, it's better to suffer now and be a champion later. And I love that because it, I mean, it's backed by the Bible. God says, pain lasts for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So if you're going through something, the morning's coming. Just hold on a little bit longer. Patient Amen. endurance. God bless you guys. If you need prayer, please come up. I'd love to pray with you guys. Amen. Woo-hoo.